there. So we already have a setup where people are saying the housing market is cooling. Even if it wasn't true or could have been perceived as a spring market, the, the narrative was that it was actually cooling. Good morning, investors. Bradley here from Watson Estates, and you're listening to the largest and fastest growing podcast for Toronto real estate on iTunes, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. In advance of the stats that are going to be released in the coming days from Treb, I wanted to let you know that the housing market boom is ending. That's right. And lawyers are about to get a whole lot busier today. We're going to break down some of those stats, why the market pendulum is swinging, the exception to the rule because there is one exception and what it means for you and your portfolio as well as who are the winners and who are the losers as we start to see this massive shift happening across the GTA and house prices. So here's the scenario. How is it that lawyers are going to get busier? Well, you purchased your next home against my advice before you sold because the market, let's face it, has been so hot that selling your property is no issue. But let's look at some numbers. You're going to get those in the next couple days announced. And you've seen price drops of 10, 15% of what you expected to sell your home for. Well, listen, the problem here now is that you haven't been able to sell your house that's been on the market for the last two weeks, and you won't be able to close on the house that you purchased without getting something in writing, some firm agreement sale document on your property. And on top of that, you're now being requested by your lender to get another appraisal done before the closing of the home you're purchasing. And guess what? No lender in the right mind will cover the shortfall that exists on that property as well. When it's all done, there won't be any money left to pay the lawyer unless you're a dentist because they have retainers. <laughs> But that's about it. We have ourselves a problem and this is new info. And, and today I want to really break down what has been going on over the last couple weeks that is really leading to this. What is the cause? Who do we blame? And what does it mean for you as an investor in your portfolio? Before I get going, you know me, I like to ask to hit that like, hit the subscribe, support the show. And if you're getting value or if this is news to you and something that you think is worth sharing with your friends, tag us on Instagram at Watson Estates. So we're going to start off talking with market stats. Now, I will begin by stating I'm not going to get into house price changes. It is segment by segment, but we will cover that on the next episode. I really wanted to wait until we got the Treb stats to break that down, but that doesn't mean that we can't be confident in what exactly has been going on in our market because we do know several things. First off, the rolling 30 days of 416 sales has stayed the same for, free, for freehold which is really just six less than last week in total and condos is less by two. So virtually identical as far as the amount of sales that has happened. Meanwhile, though, there's increasing inventory, which even myself has been hopeful and dismissive of maybe it's a spring market. Well, active listings have grown by about 180 for the second street straight week in a row and we're narrowing the gap between prior years is very much looking like the last few years as far as what we have available all of this kind of run up that's been happening with this low inventory seems to be evaporating and we're turn we're returning from a wildly low to somewhat normal level that's the first thing. Meanwhile, months of inventory is increasing and market pressure is beginning to ease. We see a very slow increase in the months of inventory, but an increase nonetheless. But there are also red flags beginning to appear, and this is what I think the news will be in the coming weeks. The first being the sales to new listings ratio. We saw back in December in Toronto, it hit a max of 117%, which is unbelievable, but it dropped all the way down into March to 64%. I wouldn't be surprised if we saw it enter below 60% in the coming weeks, 40 to 60% representing a balanced market. So we could see this very quickly shift from a seller's market into a balanced market. News I have not heard elsewhere, but it seems to be headed in that direction. My prediction is that the sales to new listing ratio will continue to drop through the remainder of March from where we saw the 64% and probably into April at least. But who knows? We're going to track that. 
416 sold over list is another red flag that I'm looking at. Now there's just over three in four houses that are still selling above list price. And you might say that's still a massive number and you would be right. But we're past the five weeks of it being over 80%. So there does seem to be this downtrend as far as what it's selling over asking. Not just that it is selling over asking, but the amount by which it is selling over asking. 416 condos sold 20% or more over asking is dropping fast. It hit a high of 31% and it has now dropped down to 23%. We are seeing not not just the number of over asking offers decreasing, but the percentage over asking is decreasing very, very quickly. Even in healthy segments, the condo market, which is notoriously the strongest market, some would say in the 416 going into this year, is also experiencing that hit. How much more will we see that in the low rise segment as these numbers are released? The TREB numbers will come out early this week. And I'll tell you now, several regions and segments have dropped in price. Some that would be surprising to your ears. So we won't get into that today, but we will get there in the coming weeks. I want the stats to be solid and I don't want to be the first one to just throw out random numbers, but it very well in many segments will be double digit declines. But just because your neighbor set a new high price on your street doesn't mean that you will. Just because my uncle was a lawyer doesn't mean my drunk... Cousin Alex can do it. <laughs> you can't even pass the bar, bro. <laughs> so besides talking about the fact that the market is changing, and maybe this is uh, news to you, and if it is, there you go. You got it. Run with it and enjoy the, the news to follow this. What I want to cover on the show today and what will, will matter in the coming weeks is why is the market changing? The why seems more important of the fact that it is. And the first big indicator that, that sticks out to me that has kind of led the, the fun here has very much been the media. This kind of vibe that was coming through in February, as we were reporting on the numbers in March, obviously we were looking very much at stats and the first half of February seemed to go up as far as months of inventory. The second half seemed to stabilize and many people were reporting on there is this you know, indication of cooling happening in our marketing market. And that has very much permeated through the news. And many people are having those conversations within the real estate community. That is the vibe. That is what people are saying is happening. And that can often be a leading indicator to the information that's circulating out there. So we already have a setup where people are saying the housing market is cooling. Even if it wasn't true or could have been perceived as a spring market, the, the narrative was that it was actually cooling. But that is just the beginning. When, when we've looked for myself, when I've looked, the, the biggest impact often is psychological. And I don't think that the impact that are having right now are only psychological, but I want to start there. I want to start with some of the psychological impacts that are playing out. And then we will get into the actual material changes that are happening because both of them are happen happening simultaneously. We have many pressures coming in from various governments, various uh, different surveys and reports, news articles. Everything seems to be single-minded on this idea that the housing market is cooling. So as it relates to the Ontario Real Estate Association, me as a licensed broker, and I'm an investor too, but I get circled in on a lot of the news coming from ARIA and they shared this tip and it's been reported on, we'll talk a little bit about it, called More Homes for Everyone Act, which was just announced. ARIA to their salespeople explained what some of the big impacts would be to the real estate community and here are some of them. They would use financial incentives to encourage municipalities to speed up zoning bylaw amendments, this idea of speeding up the process. We also have increase, increasing the certainty of development charges to bring down prices on new homes and strengthen consumer protections for purchasers of new homes by doubling fines and extending building license suspensions to address unethical conducts by developers. These are the announced changes that will happen. This all comes from the Housing Affordability Task Force recommendation, which we shared with you guys in the last few weeks. And if for those of you who remember some of the suggested changes, what is being presented here is 
just a fraction. It's almost nothing. There's almost no recommendations being made relative to the vast number of recommendations that were put forward by the task force. And this, by the way, came out from Matthew Thornton, Vice President of Public Affairs and Communications at Orea. So going outside of the real estate community and asking the question, is it really anything of value or that would change? Or is it just kind of keeping face and having some solution because of the presentation made by the task force? Well, cbc.ca reports, the plan comes after a housing affordability task force convened by the government released a report last month offering 55 recommendations. And we, I think we shared maybe 10 or 15 of the biggies in that, but there were 55 recommendations, including a goal of building 1.5 million homes in 10 years, which was extremely aggressive. That target is double the current pace of new construction. Well, what did we get? We got new municipal powers. Municipalities will also get a new power as part of the incoming legislation. The province says they can use its new community infrastructure and housing accelerator tool to speed up approvals for the creation of nonprofit housing, community centers, hospitals, long-term care homes, and other similar projects. The accelerator, by the way, cannot be used in the green belt. Also important to mention. But the bill contains measures to streamline subdivision and site plan approval processes, which deal with elements such as walkways, and parking, as well as approvals for modular multi-unit residential buildings. So a lot of good things, good things that need to be sped up. There's a lot of delays and, and holdups and site plan approvals. Well, these things are being addressed in this plan. So these are good things. Municipalities would also have to refund zoning bylaw amendment fees after January 1 if they don't make a decision within legislated timelines. So holding cities accountable to responding to applications. Like, don't hold us up. We have a plan to build housing. We need to move forward to as a province and really as a country. We'll start to see the country thing roll out in the coming months as well. But the province says it is also putting $19 million over three years towards reducing backlogs at the Ontario Land Tribunal and Landlord and Tenant Board, which is probably sweet news that's been overshadowed for some of you landlords in there that have really been struggling with getting through these processes with the landlord landlord tenant board and all these delays that have happened there's definitely a need to catch up on that backlog backlog but to get to the heart of if this is enough enough of a change we need to really jump into the the critics and the opposition which the opposition has been very loud the ndp leader andrea horwath slammed the bill in the statement saying it quote does nothing to make homes more affordable and it doesn't build starter homes or missing middle homes like duplexes and townhomes the bill does nothing to take on speculation it doesn't help renters or buyers it doesn't even do the bare minimum the government's own task force recommended which is kind of true <laughs> Kind of true. It's weak, bro. And then when we look at the leader of the Liberal Party, Stephen Del Duca, the latest Ford conservative housing plan doesn't help the first time homebuyer, won't invest in affordable housing, and there's no rent control or zoning reform. The common message here is although we're seeing a change in the market today, I will also say that the party is slightly grim because it doesn't really help first-time homebuyers. First-time homebuyers are not being helped by reduces reducing prices in the housing market. We're going to talk about why that is. Even John Pasalis piped in, it looks like Ford is unwilling to move ahead with many of the recommendations in Ontario's Housing Affordability Task Force report because it might cost him votes in the 905. Not surprised. Instead, he'll just cut red tape to solve our supply problems. A lot needs to be done. Maybe enough hasn't been done. But the point here in all of this, talking about psychology, is the government, whether it works or not, is putting forward a plan to deal with the supply issue. And that is a good thing for Ontario. That is a good thing if you're concerned about rising, rapidly increasing house prices in Ontario. So it's a good thing, though, that we have opposition in place, you know, to to counter and to police the conservatives. Every state, good state needs cops, right? Even Vatican City. They just they're called what? The Pope Po. <laughs> <laughs> but immediate impact is still uncertain. It's far from certain whether the measures coming from the government Wednesday will have any short-term impact, probably not, uh, other than psychological, on the price of buying a home in Ontario. But this is also compounded with the next issue we'll get into. But the task force recommendations were almost entirely focused on boosting supply in, into and over the coming year. So from the sake of actually dealing with affordability in Ontario... We need, there needs to be much more that happens and many of which, uh, many of the recommendations from the task force were, I think, very, very good. And I'm kind of disappointed they were ignored, kind of being overshadowed by the fact that there is an Ontario provincial election coming up. But that psychology is also compounded with another aspect, which is the foreign buyer tax. And this has a lot of news on it right now. 
which is an expansion of what happened in 2017 for the non-resident speculation tax. It's now raised from 15 to 20%. Originally, it was for the Golden Horseshoe. Now it's expanded across this great province. And for that, it really applies to anything containing at least one and no more than six single family residences. So it is a large aspect. And the NSR, the NRST applies if only one of the transferees is a foreign entity or taxable trustee, regardless of their share of ownership. So you squeeze this guy in there that's an out of out of country resident and he owns 1%. That still applies to this category. And, and therefore, um, what we're essentially trying to do is protect housing for locals. Certain individuals there will be exemptions for under this NRST expansion, including foreign nationals in the Ontario Immigration Immigrant nominee program, protected persons or refugees, spouses of Canadian citizens, or permanent residents of Canada. The one thing that's interesting here is international students are actually not exempt unless they become permanent residents. So you can't just say my kid is going to school there, therefore I qualify. So there might be a little bit of an impact that plays out there. This all coming from an email to ARIA members from Stacey Envoy, uh, the president of ARIA. But if you're going to come across the ocean, not live here, but just come to screw up our market, you're going to pay because you're a filthy pirate. <laughs> at least that's how they look at it. And so we're going to we're gonna take a piece back and it's going to be an eye for an eye. <laughs> uh, we have fun on this show, right? Got to break up this, the serious talk. And this is very much a serious talk. In the coming months, there's going to be a lot of these types of serious conversations and we're going to have fun along the way. So Better Dwelling, they asked the question, will this cool the housing market? Maybe it will actually have an impact where the uh, this idea, the recommendations made by the province didn't. Maybe this one actually will. And I'm not going to say that we actually know if it will, but they give some valid points as to why it could actually have an impact. Psychological and real and or real. Does it really matter? If it cools the housing market, then it worked whether it was a real reason or a psychological reason. Here's what they say from Better Dwelling. Toronto real estate prices cooled almost immediately after the foreign buyer tax kicked in, right? The vertical line marks the introduction of a non-resident tax in the Toronto region in the spring of 2017. Some people are still traumatized by what happened back then. From De Douglas Porter, BMO's chief economist, he says it basically instantly doused the fire housing market in the area while arguably fanning a fire in the rest of the province. Not only did it halt purchases from foreign buyers in Toronto or or hypothetically cool the housing market. I don't think it, it actually stopped foreign investing, but it cooled the housing market in those segments. It also simultaneously started investments outside of that region across Ontario. The roadblock for international investors in Toronto sent them to the suburbs. As the non-resident tax applies to the rest of the province, it's likely to have a big impact, an impact greater as a psychological tool than the capital driven elsewhere. So if everyone freaked out and ran away from Toronto to go to other parts of the province when we first announced it, Therefore, can we assume that now the entire province is included, we're going to have de declining prices across the province? I don't think that's a strong enough argument, but it's valid. It's something we should be keeping in mind. One other aspect of this is under the provincial rules, originally just the Golden Horseshoe was included, which included Toronto and other heavily populated areas of, of Southern Ontario. While the, the move, they say, brings Ontario's policies closer to those of British Columbia, which has had a higher foreign buyer tax for years. British Columbia has done a much better job at kind of maintaining some strength and not over inflating, for lack of a better word, their housing prices. They've had a lot more policies in place to keep the housing market cool. Well, now it brings Ontario more in line with BC and hopefully the result will be much of the same. But it's not clear how much of an impact the changes will actually have. Foreign owners of real estate accounted for 2.2% of all residential property in the province in 2020, according to the most recent data from Canadian Housing Stats Program. In Ontario, the highest foreign ownership rate was in the city of Toronto, funny enough, where non-residents own 3.8% of all homes and 7% of condos, according to CHSP. So when I go back and say, you know what, I don't think it's impacted the amount of purchases happening since 2017, that's where I'm getting that from. But the perception, the psychology sent people running away, that combined with COVID as well, will it therefore have an impact across the province? To be honest, I don't know. But timing is everything here, and we're just adding one more drop to the bucket. And that is the, the drop that we wanted to cover for psychological impact for the, which really the big news, which is that um, non-resident tax. But there's more taxes coming too, because argument number four and why things are kind of fighting against us is this idea of taxing the hell out of Canadians. <laughs> 
this conversation of doing that, a Remax Canada report that collabed with CIBC and the Conference Board of Canada had this report called Unlocking the Future, the Economic Chapter which offered a five-year outlook and analysis of like different scenarios that could happen between now and 2027. Well, here were some of them, interest rate hikes, annual immigration volumes, and different types of taxation. The survey commissioned found, so the report found 61% of Canadians believe real estate is the best long-term investment and they do not expect this to change over the next five years. So regardless of what happens, Canadians trust and they appreciate real estate as the number one aspect of investment. Well, however, the majority of survey respondents do consider rising property related taxes. We'll cover one of those 64%, by the way, rising interest rates, 58% think that that was going to be an issue and possible capital gains tax, 55%. A majority of people see these as barriers to buying a home in that time frame. So I was contacted actually there. So there's one scenario here. I was contacted by a reporter uh, from stories.com, I was able to comment on one of these articles, but the scenario was here to manage ballooning deficits and calm a heated real estate market. The federal government removes the capital gains tax exemption on principal residences in the next five years. My response is why are we having this conversation? <laughs> Please do not get me started. Someone's going to get hurt making those kinds of threats come up in here and talk about removing the primary residence exemption. I know I look innocent, <laughs> but you'd be shocked to know that people usually don't recognize I have a police record, you know? I love their greatest hits. <laughs> Roxanne! But here was my response when I was talking to the reporters over at Stories. Uh, a, a strident capital gains tax on primary residents could possibly open up another can of worms, though. Bradley Watson, host of your favorite fans, Toronto's number one real estate podcast, says such a tax would despoil end user home ownership of its intrinsic value and create unsustainable rental demand. The thought here is if a capital gains is taxed anywhere near as much as the primary residence. So let's say the circumstance, I guess I added my own terms here, is we're going to have the same capital gains tax, a 50% capital gains tax. It could spawn an investor class who see real estate in purely asset leveraging terms. So we're going to look at your home in the exact same light as we would look at a rental property because at the end of the day, they're taxed the same way. And Canadians love investing in real estate as the primary vehicle, but considering Canada's major urban areas already have too little rental supply, growing demand will invariably result in higher rental prices, which would, pro which would spread to secondary and tertiary markets. Here was my thought. So if I'm going to look at my house and investment property in the same light, I'm going to look for the one that has the best returns. And where is the best returns? Well, some of these secondary and tertiary markets where I can get an actual cash flow and maybe some stability in price instead of all this up and down fluctuation. As a result, if I want to live in Toronto, which is where I, at the end of the day, would like to be, I will rent my place, thereby increasing competition in the rental market and spiraling additional conflicts. Essentially, what's happening here is there's no longer a value for me to maintain my house as a primary residence as any tax benefit whatsoever, which will have immediate consequences to some of these smaller markets that can, op can offer you as investors a higher return. Just some things to, to kind of keep in mind and some of my thoughts on that. But we've got media, we've got new taxes and fear and threats very much of more taxes. And that's just the beginning. There's a quote, full scale attack on the real estate market. This comes from a Better Dwelling article quoting BMO Capital Markets, warning clients of a laundry list of measures designed to cool the market, all hitting at once. We listed some of them here, but they've got one more as well. There are measures coming from Ottawa in the coming week. We'll see what Ottawa has up its sleeve too, perhaps in the April 7th budget. There's more to come if that wasn't enough. Ottawa is leaving Canadians guessing on policy movements, but the vacant home tax is almost all but done. Canada's Department of Finance has been working on the details. So far, there's a mandate on wide loopholes, but the tax is largely a psychological tax in the first place. A vacant home tax across the country is almost developed, and we'll see what that looks like from the federal level. So my conclusion, after looking at all of these things, all these different factors, these different people attacking in unison the housing market, is when the market crashes, it will have happened because we all wanted it to.
Like, who are you going to blame? Everybody wants the housing market to crash. They're all fighting together. They're not talking to each other, but they're making these decisions with a direct psychological impact to scare the hell out of everyone and affect the housing market. You can't point your finger at any one person or any one group. It's like the time the toilet was stolen from the local police station. Detectives had nothing to go on. <laughs> But these things, though they might all be psychological at the end of the day, there's one thing that's definitely psychological but will have a real impact in affordability and is what is ultimately hurting these first-time homebuyers and is going to hurt a lot of people getting kind of caught in the crossfire, and that is interest rates. But we knew interest rates were going to rise. The problem is that interest rates are going to rise faster and sooner than anybody has expected, myself included. Some economists now think the Bank of Canada could go twice as high as it was pre-pandemic. There is a good chance the bank will ratchet its rate up by half a percentage in its meeting in April. We're talking in the next week or two, taking the benchmark rate to 1%. A big jump when we're considering a quarter percent, these kind of incremental increases. Now, all of a sudden, we're doubling it. At central banks, caution is a virtue, so they tend to move up and down slowly in 25% increments or a quarter of a percent at a time. Well, moving half a percentage point at a time at a time is a sign that the bank could be thinking more aggressive action is necessary. The bank's deputy governor at a speech in San Francisco this week was actually caught saying to attendees at this monetary policy conference that an uptick in household debt was quote worrisome and that the bank was quote prepared to take act prepared to act forcefully to ensure inflation doesn't run hot for too long. And this has already found itself through the mortgage rates. Don't think, oh, rates are going to go up. Variable rates will go up, but we know that's happening. But we already see this playing out in the fixed mortgage rate um, environment. A lot of people are already feeling the crunch and they have through the months of March. It's coming through in the data. Variable rate loans are pegged to the central bank's rate and they've been inching higher in recent weeks in anticipation of the bank's move. They know it's coming. But fixed rate loans, meanwhile, aren't impacted by the bank rate at all. They're instead priced based on what's happening in the bond market. But there too, the market has been flashing red warning signs for the past month. Rates are headed higher fast. Quote, as we get into the back half of the year, we'll see inflation starting to settle down. Not as far as the bank would like, but at least headed in the right direction. But it seems with rates rising as quick as they might start rising, that the end of the year is pretty far away. And there's a lot that will happen in the in-between. Uh, now, I am all for increasing interest rates. I think that's great. I think that is a real way to, to temper the housing market, slow things down, cool the housing market. I just don't like that it's combined with all these other psychological things. And the fact that it's speeding up, I think, has created this extra kind of fear. But I think it's ultimately good to have interest rates rise. Inflation is really, really getting out of hand. We've talked about this. In fact, I think this is too late. I think we should have been dealing with this a long time ago. But, I mean, that's my three cents. <laughs> Get it? Inflation? Anyways. <laughs> but banks have been pricing in hikes for months, and we've seen that play out. I'm going to get through some of what those rates look like today for those of you, and I think you'll be shocked. But affordability is also at the same time going to get harder. That is the point. But before we get into rates and one other thing that you're not going to hear, because it really hasn't become much of a conversation is the stress test, what that looks like. We'll get there in a minute. But I want to share with you, as promised, the one exception to the rule, the one exception, at least according to Royal LePage, of everything that's playing off happens to be in the cottage market. There's a Globe and Mail article, cooling of Ontario housing market hasn't reached cottage country yet. And they go on to talk from Royal LePage Signature Realty that there's no signs of slowdown in Romera Township, uh, north and east of Toronto. They talk about Kawartha Lakes. They're still busy, right? We've got uh, Lake Scugog in Port Perry. We got Northeast of Toronto. Uh, there's so many different, these different markets. I don't tend to play much in the cottage space, but it sounds as though they are immune in a lot of ways to some of these increases. So they're predicting this this agent from Rolla Page that demand will keep pace because these are the reasons retirees, downsizers, and first time buyers priced out of the city are all looking for areas like Aurelia, Brechin, Beaverton, Cannington, and Washago. And all of these buyers are in addition to the traditional clients searching for a cottage. So this idea that people will continue to run away. Now, I think the argument that they're doing it due to affordability is probably more of a legitimate reason than that they want to leave the city, but 
For whatever reason, there seems to be some immunity. I'll believe it when I see the stats, but the claim is that Cottage Country is still doing well. A Royal LePage Spring Recreational Report price forecast for 2022 says that Ontario Cottage Country properties are set to increase from 485000 to 653 for single-family non-waterfront homes. And it's going to increase from 624,000 in 2021 to 888,000. This is Muskoka, Aurelia area waterfront, single family cottages will soar, they say, over a million bucks. We'll be, I'll believe it when I see it because I don't think they're immune to some of these, these increases in interest rates, but they're probably immune to some of these psychological impacts and maybe that's what's playing out here. But I'll believe it when I see it. In a world where affordability and space are hard to find, cottages do seem to be the only spot for it. And Again, I'm not I'm not convinced, but we'll we'll look at some of those numbers as they're released from Treb to see if that's actually playing out. I see the impact of all of these things happening in the GTA absolutely. That's why I'm comfortable putting out this podcast in advance of some of those stats. But I can't speak to markets that I don't spend a lot of my time in. So we're gonna have to watch and rely on the experts of those areas for that. But what does all of this mean for you? All of these changes that are going to happen that you're gonna be kind of concerned of as the numbers are coming out, I wanna really break it down. The first piece of advice that I would give now more than ever is sell first and buy second. It's always the case, even in the hottest of markets, but especially now because you're going to get caught in the middle. GTA deals are on the way, but will be for a limited time. I would highly encourage those of you who are considering purchasing at the dip when the dip does happen to work on those approvals. Now, I think you'll be shocked by some of those rates, but you wanna have the gears turning because when the opportunity presents itself, you don't wanna be sitting. It just takes too long. Real estate, you know, it can, though it happens slower, it does happen, you know, within a month. So you're gonna wanna know, you're gonna keep up to date with our podcast and other sources, wherever you're getting your real estate information. And when you see that golden opportunity, be ready to move. You don't wanna get caught off guard and be running and looking for, you know, interest rate and approvals or all that stuff. Get it up front. The other thing that I think is going to play out here is that cash flow is king. Maybe that's why we see cottage countries and some of these further out areas doing well, because cash flow ultimately is the only safety net when prices are going nutty. But also, generally speaking, what you're going to see in the stats is that larger segments, so talking about detached, are actually being hit far harder than condos. So the larger the segment, generally speaking, the higher the impact right now, as far as price declines that will be uh, presented to you in the next week or so. Also, affordability isn't getting any easier because though prices are going down, which is what we were all aiming for, the biggest reason because of it is because rates are going up. And therefore, it doesn't actually help you in the affordability front. John Pasalas put it like this. The monthly payment on a million dollar mortgage last year at 1.75% was 4,115. Well, today at 4%, we're looking at over $5,200. So we're entering an interesting period for the housing market. He says high home prices, rising interest rates and rising prices for everything else we buy. So where I want to kind of uh, go at the end of this podcast is somewhere where no one has gone before. And something that's just been sitting in the back of my mind is how does this all play out? Because we've had this stress test long before interest rates started rising and we weren't too worried about it because, you know, it was well over 5% and like rates aren't going over 5%. So I'm th- I was I'm thinking well well we're getting there right so what does how what impact does that have on the stress test so here we go when I look at bmo.com who really illustrates and defines what that stress test looks like this is what it says the most recent changes introduced a new mortgage qualifying rate for all uninsured and insured mortgages all mortgages all applications submitted on or after June first. The minimum qualifying rate is based on either the benchmark rate of 5.25% or the rate offered by your lender plus 2%, whichever is higher. That's key. Whichever is higher. At what point do we have rates that are higher when you add 2% than the benchmark rate? Well, guess what? We're already there. And this is definitely playing itself out for those of you who are going to apply for mortgages at the bank or wherever you get your mortgage. When I look on RateHub, the lowest five-year rate I see right now is 3.04%, but I'll tell you that is very, very low. Most lenders right now are in the mid threes. And when we go to the banks, TD, they got the cheapest rate at 4.59%. BMO, CIBC, RBC all sit at 4.79%. 
and National Bank and Scotia Bank are at 4.99%. That number will be a shock to those of you who haven't been looking for a mortgage or qualifying lately, but that's right. Major banks are at 5% rate, which means if you were, let's say, getting a mortgage today at Scotia and you were going to qualify for that mortgage, you no longer are just qualifying at 5.25. You would be qualifying at 7%. That's right. Buying your first house and qualifying at 7%. How you like them apples? And what does that do to affordability? We've been, we've been struggling at 5%, many people, and now we're talking 7 So I can see that definitely becoming an issue with people's ability to qualify. So though, yes, there's a psychological element to a lot of these things, including an increasing in interest rates, we already see this playing its way out through mortgage applications. And therefore, I think this is why we're going to see as the numbers will show us in the coming days that the price of housing is already being impacted. It's not just necessarily a spring market, but because of all of these factors, people are feeling the pinch a lot sooner than expected. You guys will remember one of those big deal breakers of this fact that we could have continued price growth in the coming months would be a rapid increase in interest rate or government directly attacking the housing market. Both of those things, as you can see in our podcast today, are happening. So who would be the winners and who would be the losers? The winners by my book would be move up buyers, people that are going to be able to take advantage of the discount prices on some of the larger asset classes, as well as investors who are looking for buying opportunities and have maybe been sitting out because of the multiple offers and they just haven't wanted to deal with that. But one of the other ones that might surprise you is realtors. Realtors have had a really tough go the last six to nine months because of all the bidding wars and really time wastes and off offer presentations. Now, all of a sudden, if we find ourselves in a balanced market, that is a healthy market, one in which myself as a realtor can operate far not more nicely. But the losers, there are losers as well. First time home buyers, as you can see, good luck qualifying for your 7% interest rate. Affordability is taking a massive hit. And although maybe the call and the cry of all people has been bring house prices down, that way, someone like my children can one day afford a house. Guess what? Bringing house prices down is not has not solved the crisis. In fact, the making it more unaffordable is the reason house prices have come down. The situation just got a whole lot worse for those folks, as well as the downsizers that were maybe relying on some of those large, maybe they're large um, detached. You're going to move into a condo. They're kind of fighting against the current a little bit. Or if cottages do hold their ground, they're looking to sell that detached with, with some struggle and then move out to the cottage country where there could still be a lot of activity and a lot of demand. That would not be such a good situation. Also, the worst person, the worst situation you could possibly find yourself in, fortunately for myself, none of my clients went this route. Everybody, obviously I'm keeping them up to date on what's going on and, and having these conversations. But those of you who unfortunately have bought something and who need to sell your home and can't, I do think that there's exceptions in all of these rules, but if that's you, you bought, you're trying to sell and you can't, I'm sorry, that's a tough go. That And, and you're gonna end up feeling the pain for that. But th with all of that in mind, actually there would be one more winner, which is your lawyer. <laughs> your lawyer could end up uh, having a lot of, a lot of demand as he, as he continues to help you. So that's, I mean, you gotta love the law, right? <laughs> Not. <laughs> You know the difference between in-laws and outlaws? <laughs> outlaws are wanted. Who wants in-laws? <laughs> oh, the law. You know, I'm kidding, right? I'm kidding. I love my in-laws, right? I took my mother-in-law out yesterday morning. Being a sniper is awesome. <laughs> I hope you guys learned some stuff and uh, I'll see you next time. Uh, please leave some comments down below. Let me know as the stats are released with Treb, what you're seeing, feeling, and experiencing. Those of you who are seasoned investors or real estate professionals out there, I'd love to get the feedback and have a conversation that a lot of people are going to be confused about. And hopefully this episode has cleared things up. If it has, please share it on Instagram. Tag your friends. You can tag us at Watson Estates. And if you could as well, what would be the most valuable thing for myself as a thank you for all the work, the effort, the hours of effort that go into every single episode is please, please, please leave a five-star rating and review on iTunes. It would mean the world, but I will see you guys next time. Take care and keep it real.